after World War II, the white middle class soared to prosperity as a result of bills like the GI Bill. And um, African Americans who were coming home from war didn't get those benefits simply because they were African American. The U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs denied African Americans access to those benefits simply because of their race. And uh, you are correct in saying that no one today dealt with that particular issue. With that being said, however, there was wealth amassed um, as a result of those programs that still exists today. And w when I think of your example about an individual who works as a janitor and sees people dining in a beautiful cafe walking home from work, I, I want to ask you, do you think any of that indignation, given certain circumstances, might actually be justified simply because there have been systematic blocks in people's way throughout American history, not ending with slavery, not ending with the Jim Crow laws, uh, not ending, some would say even today, we still have housing discrimination. All of which is to say, um, you found that during the Cold War era, there was a massive boom in uh, the, the white middle class's prosperity, and you just didn't have that among African Americans, not because they weren't meritorious, but because they were discriminated against. So, let me ask, let, let, you know, we're, in a, we're in, a, in a very smart college, it's worth pursuing a discussion on these points. So there are Americans whose present benefits are due to past advantage. By the way, this past advantage, which is often assumed to continue with the white man, actually goes all the way back to the beginning. The American Indians who were here first, right, had a huge advantage. We presume that they owned the whole country. Now, how do you, by the way, let's pause for a moment. How do you get to own a country? If, if you have Cain and Abel, and Abel is a shepherd, and Cain is a farmer, and Cain says, okay, I'm not going to put a fence around the whole world. I own it, because I'm the only guy here. You're a shepherd. And my descendants will now inherit the earth, and anybody who shows up is a usurper. Rousseau says that the first guy who puts up a fence and claims he owns something is a, is a con man. So the American Indians came. They happened to be first. They came in a bunch of tribes. The Navajos who got the land took it from the Hopi or the Pueblo. Their law of the jungle was conquest. That's how they got the land. There's a big fight about the Black Hills that I cover in the film. The, the, the Sioux who got the Black Hills took it from the Cheyenne. So when we say, oh, give us the land back, are you going to turn around and give it back to the Cheyenne? Oh, no. It's ours. Really? How come you own it forever now? So what I'm getting at here is history is very complicated. Let me give you an example of India, so we can look at this at the level of theory, okay? India was invaded by the British, and earlier by the Afghans, and the Persians, and the Mongols. So you have all these successive invasions, right? Are you actually saying that you believe in a rule of social justice today that says globally, let's look at this as a, as a global rule of justice, I'm going to figure out whose ancestors did what to whom, and I'm going to return goods that were illicitly taken from the beginning to the people who had it originally. Do you believe that that's a viable way to organize our society? Do you believe, if I can ask you a direct question, that you are the beneficiary of white privilege here at Amherst? I, I yes do. Or no? Well, yeah. And I'll, I'll, pause. Okay. Uh, well. If you are, <laughs> if you are, can I ask you a further question? Oh, okay. Yeah. But I, I, I don't just say it in a sort. I, I don't say it in a self-flagellating and self-aggrandizing way. Hold on. Gonna, okay. I, go on. You know, I, I really try not to. I'm simply saying that because you asked me. Really, I, I view the recognition of one's privilege as an impetus to change things. So I don't just say I have white privilege. I try to help those who have not benefited from really? such privilege. Really? How? I, hold on, hold on. Let, let's pursue this for a moment. Sure. You say, let's, this is actually very important because there's, okay. there's a psychology here, sure. right? 
Well, you see, here's, I'm going to answer your question, but I, and I'm really not trying to attack you. I'm not trying to be provocative. I just find that often, I think the essence of much of this discourse surrounds, uh, surrounds hypocrisy. And you're trying to, maybe you're trying to demonstrate that I'm a hypocrite. I, I say I benefit from white privilege, yet I don't actually do anything. But I, I'm going to, I'm going to backpedal and say that ultimately I think what the greatest vice is, is cruelty. And, um, I, I'm not going to, I don't want to be hypocritical. So to answer your question, I'll start in high school. Um, I, and, I mean, do, do people want to hear this? Or yes, do, do we? Educated. Go ahead. <laughs> Tell them. Let them know. <coughs> Look, I, I, let me say where I'm going with this. Because I think you're... I, All right, well... All of which to say, I, it's not like I picked anyone out to help uh, based on the color of their skin, but I was a tutor for people who tended to be low income when I was in high school. Um, I suppose that that would be one, one direct answer to your question, because oftentimes disparate educational opportunities are grounded in disparate economic systems, or systems that produce disparate economic outcomes. So that's okay. one way that I would combat it on an individual level. All right. Here's what I'm getting with this, okay? One of the benefits of a good education of reading people like Nietzsche is you begin to understand how deep the human desire is to, for moral self-exculpation. Moral self-exculpation. Now, you say, and I didn't say this, you said this, I'm a beneficiary of illicit white privilege, okay? Illicit? Well, isn't all white privilege illicit? Ill is it deserved? Well, in this, I mean, in this current system, there is legality. I mean, that... illicit means immoral. Okay. Then... Immoral white okay. privilege. Yeah. Okay. So then, if I were to say to you, there are surely many deserving minorities who would like to come to Amherst but have the inherited disadvantage of American history. Therefore, since you are an acknowledged beneficiary of illicit privilege, would you be willing to step aside voluntarily, putting your own moral mouth where your uh, self-proclaimed virtue is, and give your seat, your seat, not my seat, I realize you may be super generous with other people's advantages, and favor affirmative action so other white kids who apply to Amherst are turned away, to open spaces for minorities, but I'm not talking about you acting out your virtue on them. I'm talking about you acting out your virtue on you. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to give up your illicit seat that you don't deserve here at Amherst to make room for a disadvantaged minority, yes or no? Okay, well, let me start here. I don't know how you got on the topic of affirmative action. By following I, the logic of I, your... No, no, I, I never said specifically that I think that race-based affirmative action is the best way to rectify um, the systems of injustice that... Have, why I'm don't sorry? you practice it by stepping out? And, and why don't you go to the registrar tomorrow and tell him you want to withdraw from Amherst? Are you listening to what he just said? Get off. Yeah. Tell I'm listening. Think about it. Go ahead. Okay, well, but, I mean, I, look, I, I'm only continuing to engage because you continue to engage with me, and I, I do want to hear other people's questions. But in response to that, again, what you're trying to demonstrate is that everyone's hypocritical. As someone once said that we're all, we're all dirty up to our arms, right? We're not all perfect. None of us is perfectly morally consistent. Now, I've said absolutely nothing about affirmative action. The fact is that I believe everyone in this room is hypocritical to some degree. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't strive for a more just and equitable system entirely. Um, there have been points in my life in which I have given up uh, some of the privileges with, it, with which I have been endowed simply because I realized that it wasn't the right thing to do. At the same time, I think everyone needs to survive and that we, ex we understand that we exist in an imperfect system and that we have to conduct our business in such a way as to not only adhere to our moral standards but to the standards imposed upon us by the system in which we live. And I, I think that we have to be generous to people in their efforts to not be hypocritical and then do their best. But I don't think that we should totally throw away the idea that we shouldn't have those standards at all. 
Um, and so that's my response to you, but I would still like a response to my question regarding the inequity that I talked about uh, with the uh, U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs. That is wealth that is passed down, and it's documentable wealth. The same way that the wealth created or the wealth stolen as a product of slavery was also documentable wealth. We have numbers that demonstrate precisely how much wealth was stolen, and that's money that in some way could be given back. Now, if we're saying that it's absolutely impossible Possible to give that money back because it's too hard to trace. We'd have to uh, give money to the African tribes. We'd have to give money to people who are no longer exist. That's absolutely fine, but we have to understand that we haven't really come to terms with that injustice that's been perpetrated. And if we are admitting that no one um, that no one is perfectly entitled to absolutely everything that their uh, ancestors were, uh, had stolen from them, then we also have to accept that there are people today who benefit from the fact that their parents and grandparents profited from this immoral system. And, and the way to deal with that is with a social safety net that enables everyone to thrive. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you there. <clears throat> yes. Well. The, the core of the American system, this will actually answers your question directly, is that how do, what do we do about the conquest ethic of the past? And here there are two options. There are two options. One option is we establish equal rights under the law. That was the solution of the civil rights movement, that we have had race-based discrimination, we've had racial hierarchy. Let's stop. Let's treat people according to the color of this, according to the content of their character. Equal rights under the law. <laughs> Equal rights under the law. The other option, which you're defending, is you could essentially call it, let's correct for history. Let's correct for history. Let's try to find out who are the people in possession of stolen goods, and let's return it. Now, the first thing I'm trying to say is, this is a hugely controversial principle because it actually involves wrecking the freedom of a free society. You basically have to, to put it frankly, if we were to carry that out, go into people's homes and take their stuff. Take their furniture, take their cars. You don't seem to have even the guts to do that. You don't have the moral self-confidence to do it yourself. It may be, if I am advocating a rule of social justice and I'm advocating it for the whole society, before I persuade everybody else, let's say I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Christian and I believe everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And I go, you know what? There, the Bible says this, the Bible says that everybody should give 10% of their wealth to help the poor. And somebody says, Dinesh, are you giving 10% of your wealth? And I'm like, actually no, but I did do some tutoring. And you go, wait a minute, aren't you advocating? Aren't you saying that there is a moral duty to do this? Why don't you do it? Before you convince us, you do it. And you're like, I don't think I should do it because society is extremely complex. And I don't think I should do it unless everybody else does it. No. Either you believe in it and you do it. Once you've done it, you might impress us. And then you might convince the rest of us that our wealth is also ill-gotten. But you can't do it. And I'm not trying to indict everybody of hypocrisy, only you. Because, because you're, the one, you're the one who said, I'm the beneficiary of illicit privilege. So you're a really good starting point, because I'm asking, if you're in possession of stolen goods, why aren't you willing to return them? So that's why fundamentally I see your charity. You know, during the Civil War there was a guy who goes, I'm very happy to give so I've given three cousins to the war and I'm ready to sacrifice my wife's brother. <laughs> That's basically your ethics. You're willing to have social justice if other people pay, but you're not willing to pay. So that's the problem. And that's the problem with the progressivism that marches behind social justice while protecting its own privileges. You know how you said, we all have to survive. Really? You have to be at Amherst to survive? You don't have to be at Amherst to survive. You have to be at Amherst to benefit. You have to be at Amherst because you're getting opportunities at this college that many other people are not getting. So if you say you believe in equal opportunity, you're a hypocrite because you are taking advantage of opportunities unavailable to others. But for you, this hypocrisy is fully justified because you are militating on behalf of the poor. 
But if it's if if you are against privilege, this college is privilege. So there's a glaring hypocrisy, and you will never turn your moral mirror on yourself to say, what am I doing about it? That's my point. For you, society should act before you do, to enforce your moral code. Let's take a couple more questions. <laughs>